I'd like to thank Metals Investor Forum for hosting another great event. And uh, I guess we'll get things started. If anybody's wondering why silver is taking a beating lately, um, my best guess is it was overbought about three or four weeks ago, as well as the dollar which took off and yields which took off. And uh, silver is about 80% negatively correlated with the US dollar. So that's just my thesis. That should explain most of what we've been uh, dealing with for the last, uh, last three weeks or so. But all that means that the opportunity is even better. And uh, let's get started. So there all, are all sorts of risks if you look at on the environment, all kinds of reasons you'd want to be cautious or careful. Recession risk, this is probably the most forecasted recession we've ever, we've ever, we're likely to get. Inflation remains high, nowhere near what central banks are targeting. Um, I think unlikely to, to reach anywhere near what they're targeting. We're obviously dealing with a banking crisis. Highly unlikely that that is, is over. A debt ceiling limit, that's coming to a head soon. De-dollarization, you've got uh, deals going on back and forth. You've got uh, Russia with Iran um, looking to set up a gold-backed stablecoin so they can trade with that as a remuneration. You've got Brazil and China that have agreed to trade based on real or yuan. And then you have central bank digital currencies that uh, more than 130 countries are working on and uh, working on rolling out. And you can bet that is absolutely coming as well. Another threat. So let's start looking at these. Fed confidence is falling. Anybody surprised? You know, calling inflation transitory at um, 4 or 5% when it actually eventually went to 9% and we're still at 5 after raising rates to, uh, to uh, over 5%. We're looking at the lowest ratings in 20 years. Really, there, that should not be a surprise. People are, are obviously uh, not happy with how things are going. Their mortgages have doubled in many cases and cost of living has shot up. If you look at 5,000 years of history, there's a, in a, I can't say in some ways interesting because it's a really, really, really tough read, but the history of interest rates, not a cheap book either, by the way, but if you want to understand interest rates, this is the place to look, and uh, I'll save you uh, some effort. 5,000 years of history, this chart shows back to 3,000 BC. The average rate, most of that time was in the four to maybe 6% range. So what we've been living in the last 15 years or so, rates at zero is absolutely a dramatic outlier. Something you couldn't have unless you'd have the construct of something like a central bank that could force rates low and keep them low. So here's a really interesting quote from one of the co-authors of the book, Richard Silla. He says, remember, we're just getting back to what in most of human history would be considered normal rates. So we'll get back to that in a moment. Inflation is slowing, but it's still really quite high. Inflation hit over 9% last summer. We're around 5% right now. I like to say 4% is going to be the new 2%. I really don't see the Fed, and in fact, it seems like they're starting to admit it, but I don't see the Fed ever getting rates back down to anywhere close for any kind of extended period, around 2%. In fact, there are some rumblings right now that the Fed, uh, probably post-recession, is going to potentially revisit their, uh, their target of 2% and may eventually actually up that to 3%. I don't think that's going to be realistic either. I think we're in a, a, at least a decade's worth of, uh, of elevated inflation levels. Um, and um, sticky prices for certain items are, are remaining high. That's an indication of what we're facing. Producer prices are staying high. And uh, again, this is going to be uh, the kind of environment that we're in for quite some time. This is also nothing new to anyone, but U.S. debt keeps piling up. It actually doubled from about 15 to or 16 to 32 trillion currently. And as dramatic as this chart looks, the more important part of the chart is actually the bottom, where it shows you debt to GDP ratios. In 1970, the debt to GDP was 35%. Currently, we're looking at 129%. So as difficult as it was for Volcker to raise rates to 18 or 20%, he, 
he had the ability to do it because the debt relative to GDP and the debt uh, as a pure number was just dramatically lower. And so to even for the government to pay interest on a much smaller debt was doable. We're right now over $900 billion of annual interest payments on the U.S. debt. It's likely to cross a trillion dollars this year. And if we do some quick math, $32 trillion of debt at 5%, which is the historical average for long-term rates, 5,000 years of, of history shows us that, 5% on $32 trillion would be $1.6 trillion a year. The U.S. budget is $6 trillion. That's over 25% of the U.S. budget could conceivably be going just to paying interest. That's not a very productive use of $1.6 trillion every year. And that's if we make it to 5% and don't go any higher. And that's without counting even higher debt levels. So I talked about the banking crisis, which just this chart shows us is that dot all the way over on the right of five, uh, $550 billion. That's what we've had so far in losses from the banking crisis. That's, that's just three regional banks. And if you compare that to the financial crisis over here, that was $373 billion. And that was the total during the financial crisis. We're already almost 50% above, and we've just gotten started in this banking crisis. So that is, it's understandable that people are worried about that. And that leads into some of the next points. U.S. money market funds have now reached an all-time high of over $5.3 trillion in holdings. Bloomberg's, Bloomberg tells us that obviously it's from the Fed hike and from people being concerned with what's going on with regional banks. They're concerned about their deposits in regional banks. But intended or not, what you now have is you have the Fed competing with banks. People can buy six-month treasuries that are paying 5.4%. They can put their money into a, into a U.S. money market that's paying much better yields than a bank deposit, for example. And remember, bank deposits have limits. It looks like those limits might be out the window, but $250,000 FDIC limits are technically the limit. So people are concerned. They're pulling their money out of banks and they're plowing it into money market funds. The flip side of this is that that helps to create another opportunity because that's a lot of cash that's sitting on the sidelines. Here's some of the fallout from that. That red line at the bottom is the KRE ETF, which is a regional bank ETF in the US. That's down about 40% over the last three months. And people are starting to really seriously look at alternatives and they're finding it in precious metals. Gold and silver, until at least a few weeks ago, are up about seven to 10%. That's almost a 50% outperformance in the last three months between precious metals and regional bank stocks. And investors are starting to follow the lead of, uh, of central bankers. I like to say, do as they do, not as they say. Well, central banks over the last 50 years, about 13 years ago, flipped from being net sellers to net buyers of gold. And last year in particular was an absolute standout year, more than double any of the prior 12 years. 1,136 tons of gold was bought by central banks. Most of that was bought by Russia, China, India, and Turkey. So I talked about de-dollarization. You can bet that they, uh, they saw what happened to Russia with their assets being frozen, and they don't want to be caught in the same position. So you have high net worth investors. You have eventually even retail investors are really starting to pay attention, and I'll show a bit more proof of that as well. So Bloomberg recently did a survey and they asked if the U.S. were to hit the debt ceiling, what would be your single top choice for an investment? Well, professional investors said 52% of them said gold will be their top, in, top choice. 46% of retail investors said gold would be their top choice. So as you can see, the winds are, are starting to blow towards precious metals and um, investors are starting to realize that uh, they need safe havens in this kind of environment. Another survey, this time by Gallup last month, asked Americans what they thought would be the best long-term investment. 
And obviously, typically, stocks is way up there. That has flipped. They've actually said that gold is their preferred long-term investment. That hasn't happened for 13 years. So again, investors are really starting to look at precious metals, gold and silver, as fantastic alternatives and safe havens in this kind of environment. So how does this bring us to silver as being an asymmetric opportunity? Well, silver, compared to gold in particular, is very much undervalued. Gold is near an all-time high. Silver is at less than half of its all-time high, uh, which was set first in 1980. It's the only major metal that is still dramatically below its all-time high. Jörg Keener, who is a founder of Swiss Asia Capital, was interviewed on CNBC and said, silver is trading at historically such a beaten down level. Expect to see a massive move in silver. So now let's turn to some raw numbers on the supply and demand side. Last year, 2022, was an all-time record for silver demand. We reached 1.24 billion ounces of silver. That was an incredible 18% increase over 2021. Think about that. 18% more silver was required in 2022 than in 2021. Industrial demand was up 5%. Solar panels, which we'll talk about a little bit more shortly, were up 28% in demand. Jewelry was up 29%. Silverware was up 80%. By the way, jewelry and silverware were led mostly by India, so that's a particular situation, but that's still likely to continue, perhaps not at the same level. Net investment, so that's mostly retail investors, but some institutional investors buying coins and bars. That was up 22% to a new all-time high. 333 million ounces of silver were bought by investors. So now let's switch back to, I mentioned solar panels. This is really the uh, sort of the elephant in the room when it comes to industrial silver demand. According to the International Energy Agency, if we're going to reach the solar output that they expect by 2030, solar panel installations are going to have to grow on a 25% annual rate to get from here to there. And that's going to mean huge ongoing demand for solar panels, which of course are one of the biggest demand factors for silver. The chart on the left shows you uh, within that red circle. So you see 2021, 110 million ounces went to solar panels. And then 2022, 140 million ounces went to solar panels. That was a huge jump. That orange line, that dotted line, is silver loadings. So that's the amount of silver that goes into a solar panel, that, that goes into solar panels um, with current technologies. Now the chart on the right shows you three different technologies for solar. The first dark blue chart is PERC. That gold, uh, sorry, that gold bar is TopCon, and the next generation of technology. And then the far blue media. The far right medium blue bar is HJT, and that's the follow-on technology that's already somewhat in use. So TopCon already uses 50% more silver than the current most common technology, and HJT is going to use 150% more silver than the current adopted technology. And so you might be asking, why would these manufacturers use that much more silver? Well, it's a cost-benefit analysis. It's pretty straightforward. For the, for the additional cost of silver, they're getting more than extra output of energy from the solar panel. So those, these technologies require more silver, and it's absolutely worth it for the, for the energy output. According to Rystad Energy, this is just recent data that they've released, they expected this year 80% of all new solar cell manufacturing will use these next two generations of, of solar panels. So that means that this is really being adopted as we speak. Um, and that's why I think that, in fact, the, the consumption, the demand for silver for solar panels is actually going to be uh, dramatically under, uh, underestimated this year and, and onward. So the supply side, remember, demand was up 18%. Supply from mining has actually been falling on balance since 2015. Supply last year, again, with demand up 18%, mine supply was down 1%. Scrap, which only represents about 15% of overall supply, was up 3%.
So overall supply was only up 1% when you had demand up 18%. New supply has been falling. So this is the in incremental supply every year to the, to the uh, silver mining um, side of the market. Why is so much less silver being added to the supply every year? It takes 15 years to get a mine from discovery to production. Ounces are of lower grade. Miners are, are having to look farther along for them. And um, with rates, with prices relatively low, profits are, are slim. And so the attraction to, to mine new ounces of gold is uh, certainly less attractive. Here's another reason why new silver coming to market has been low. This shows you the amount of spending by members of the SIL ETF. So that's a silver ETF. CapEx is down 40% over the last 10 years. So clearly they're obviously not spending on trying to develop new silver mines. What has that done is it's led to deficits. In fact, dramatic deficits in the silver, in the silver industry. For the past 10 to 11 years, we've had minor surpluses. And then in 2021, we had a deficit. So in 2020, there was a surplus of 50 million ounces. 2021, a deficit, complete reversal, deficit of 51 million ounces. 2022, a dramatic leap from there to 237 million ounces. That was last year. The forecast for this year is for 142 million ounces, again, of deficit. And I think that, especially with what's going on in the, silver, in the solar panel industry, that's, that's gonna be a low ball. It's probably gonna be, at least in my view, closer to 160 or 180 million ounces. So if you look at that chart, that shows you the green is the surpluses for about 10 or 11 years, and this, this red blob on the right is the last couple of years of deficits. And an interesting quote from the Silver Institute that released its survey uh, a month ago said that the combined 2021 and 2022 deficits have more than offset the cumulative surpluses of the previous 11 years. So think about that dramatic flip in the silver market. It took two years to absorb all of the surpluses and then some of the previous 11 years. There's really a lot happening in the silver markets when it comes to demand and the supply is completely unable to keep up. A little bit more research. This is from Bank of America Global Research. And what they did was they compared a number of base metals, including as well as platinum, aluminum, copper, nickel, zinc, etc. And they looked out five years, and they looked out 10 years, and they looked at the potential projected deficits on their own uh, calculations in terms of what we might be looking at. And by far, silver had the most dramatic deficits in the next 10 years. And so we can certainly expect that the deficits that we've been living through the last couple of years are going to go on for quite some time. That's just going to be very bullish for silver. I've used this chart before, but I think it's worth revisiting. This shows you two things. The white line is accumulated cash flows from operations from gold and silver miners. And in the last cycle, you can see that that line shot up when the prices of gold and silver shot up and they were cash machines. And what happened within a short time is that these green bars were M&A activity. They went out and started acquiring each other and obviously, you know, use their much higher share prices in some cases to do that, their cash as well. So what you've had in the la this recent cycle is since 2019, you've had cash flows accumulate dramatically, but the green bars are almost nowhere to be seen. So that means that the M&A that we saw in the last cycle hasn't even happened yet. You've had a few deals take place and um, they're indicative of what we might be looking for, but you can bet that with the shortfalls and the difficulty of finding good high-grade silver projects, absolutely a lot of these companies are going to be on the radar of some bigger producers and you're going to have acquisitions, you're going to have, um, you're going to have mergers, you're going to have all sorts of things happen. And um, not only are they going to take advantage of the current low prices, they're going to take advantage of um, the potential to uh, find synergies between them. So to give you a, a rough idea, some of the uh, some of the, re of the returns we've managed in the last uh, few months in the, my newsletter, Silver Stock Investors, some recent performance. 
that of course has changed in the last few weeks, but nonetheless, it's some idea of uh, what, can, what that can produce. One multi-billion dollar silver company was up 52% in just six months. A billion dollar silver producer was up 35% over two months. And this is a company that plans to quadruple its production in the next 18 months. And they have, their next project is a, uh, a very attractive deposit that could, that could be another multi hundred million ounce deposit, all high grade. A small growing silver producer was up 128% in the past year. They're expecting to double their production this year. And another quickly growing silver and gold explorer was up 81% in the last six months. So again, these are just some kind, some of the uh, potential returns that uh, you can look towards in this space. To get a, a great overview of the, uh, of the potential and uh, from start to, to finish in terms of the silver market, uh, I published this book last year called The Great Silver Bull. Um, it really gives you the history of silver. It lays out the uh, supply demand uh, aspect of it, shows you how you can build a silver portfolio and ultimately when we get there, how and when to sell to lock in those gains. The best way, though, is to follow real time, and uh, you can follow me on silverstockinvestor.com. That's my newsletter and the website for it. I'm on Twitter. You can follow me at, on Twitter at Peter underscore Kraut, and I'm on LinkedIn at Peter Kraut. Thanks, thanks very much. 